this is Prague, as you can see. The you know it's really all the same meeting room and the same windowless thing in the basement. Anyway, um, yeah. So this is clearly IETF 100 in Singapore, and today is Monday, the 13th of November, 2017. Um, Bill couldn't make it here, so I'll be running the meeting. Um, this is a IETF working group meeting. Um, uh, IETF IPR rules apply. This is the note well. Um, if this is your first IETF meeting and this is your first session of your first IETF, I usually do these on like on Friday. So it's like, it's just, oh, here's a note well. If you haven't seen it by now, then yeah. yeah. So it's actually um, entirely possible that you haven't seen the um, note well by now. Um, so if you haven't, um, I'm actually just going to keep talking louder until um, everybody gets quiet enough that people can hear. Um, so, I mean, I am amplified. I, the nice thing about having the mic up front is I can actually get louder and louder and louder. If you do want to have side conversations, there are hallways. Can you take it outside, please? Thank you. So, um, this is a um, IETF working group meeting. This is the note well. These are the uh, IETF IPR rules. If you have not seen this, these are kind of important. Um, please go have a look at RFC 5378 and RFC 8179. Um, so, working group status. Um, since uh, Prague, hey, we've rechartered. Um, uh, welcome to all the IAM, IOAM folks in the room. Um, we are happy um, that you have a home with us here. Um, we published um, 8250, um, and we've got uh, three um, drafts that are basically ready to go. Model based metrics is in the RFC editor queue. I saw there's one more. Um, uh, update to that. Uh, is that editor comments? Uh, unsurprising. Um, and uh, we have one in um, uh, ISJ evaluation, the um, Altmark draft. That's I think that's on the telechat after this meeting. Um, there was a uh, one comment and then an obscure um, review that came in um, that delayed. Um, uh, that to after the uh, ITF 100. And we have um, Twampyang 05, which is in needs write up state. And then it goes to um, Al Morton. Uh, we've got a write up. Uh, okay. Nalini, Nalini prepared it. She's our document, volunteer document shepherd. Okay. And we'll see the status of that in a minute. Okay. But so is, I, I didn't see it in the data tracker. So it's in there? Okay. Since, the, since I did these slides, probably then. Um, okay, cool. Um, over here. Uh, I'm not entirely certain why that's not working. Yes, okay. Page down. Right, it's a Mac. It's not Focus Follows Mouse. Um, here's today's agenda. Um, we've got uh, three working group documents, 2330 IPv6, the, the update modernization of that. We've got the um, two registry drafts, uh, which we'll be talking about together, and then we've got IOEM data. Frank, you said you needed five minutes, but I'm giving you 15 because it seems like we might actually want to discuss a couple of things there. Yeah. Um, then we have um, individual contributions. Um, so the IPPM advanced routing, um, Greg's two drafts on stamp, um, and then um, this is the port TUM test update where we're also going to be talking about um, 2MP Yang, correct? That's right. So so if you want to do that at the after the individual contributions, we could. But it's really all about um, Greg's comment to the Yang model shepherding form, right. which clarified the text of the port draft. So you want to move that up to, yeah. to, to, so the, it, to the, let's move that up to the working yeah, group Yeah, let's document. move up to working group documents. Let's bash that up to right after IOM data then. Yeah. Okay. And that's, yep. and that's but that's probably still five minutes. Yep. Cool. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, then we have a relatively long um, lightning talk queue, but it looks like um, uh, yeah. Since we're starting on time here, we'll probably get to all of these. Um, oh, and I see Tal's name there. So thank you very much, Tal, for taking um, minutes. Uh, if we have one remote, um, so if we could get somebody who's um, already on Jabber to Jabberscribe, in case. Um, the meet echo doesn't work there. Anybody already on Jabber? Probably not. You'd otherwise you'd show up in the thing there. Um, all right, we'll we'll assume that meet echo works. Then. So with that, Viniac.
Okay, uh, so I'm going to be presenting uh, the IPv6 update to uh, 2330. Um, so this was this. Next slide, please. Uh, so this was necessitated by comments by uh, Fred uh, and what he defines uh, and, and Brian Carpenter and uh, what he defines is standard form packets, uh, what should be like a valid measurement packet. Um, and the results are dependent on what kind of uh, packet uh, measurement type packet do you have. So we call it abstract term packet of type P. Next slide, please. Um, so this, uh, I'm going through the initial sites quickly because this has been presented in the working group uh, for quite some time, quite some time before. Um, so IPv6, uh, IPv6 is currently out of uh, out of scope for RFC 2330 IPVM uh, framework. Uh, so the idea was to uh, write a draft that gets it into uh, uh, the 2330 uh, format um, and and define the same. Um, as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, trigger was uh, input by Brian Carpenter saying no IPv6 coverage. Uh, so IPv6 support for IPVM was outsourced to a dedicated draft, and this is that draft. Next slide, please. Um, so it has been adopted as a working group item in uh, July 2016. Uh, there have been multiple review comments by Fred, by Marcus, Marius. Um, So, uh, so the, uh, in I IAT of 99 meeting, there were a bunch of uh, open topics, handling of large packets in IPv6, which leads to fragmentation. Uh, the extent of coverage for six low and IPv6 header compression. Uh, I think this was suggested by Spencer. Um, and then there was a discussion about the theoretical concept of a minimum standard form packet. And uh, the way IPv6 header treatment is done in uh, uh, inter intermediate. So those of you who are subscribed to the IETF discussion mailing list, and I think V6 Ops, if I'm right, uh, there was a lot of heated discussion about how to uh, how to uh, handle extension headers, whether they should be touched by middle boxes or not, and that has a direct impact on how the measurement has uh, measure measurements are done, and you know uh, uh, it affects the measurement. So next slide. Okay, uh, so the uh, so we have decided that uh, fragments are not standard form um, and uh, use the same kind of handling that we have for IP IPv6 that we have for IPv4 as well. Um, and uh, for measurements, we will have uh, non-fragmented packets. Um, yeah, and that also means that if we if we do not adopt this, we'll have to review and update existing IPPM um, R metric RFCs, which is which, which is what we don't want to do at this point in time. Okay. Um, so since the last working group, I think the major uh, change was uh, the suggestion of six low and six low pan. Um, so we were uh, Yokim and me and the other co-authors actually went up and looked. Uh, at uh, six, six low, six low pan uh, related drafts, and uh, we realize, especially the header part, whether it is uh, header compression using Slack or I think if I remember right, Shik, um, it actually deviates. Uh, it has some. Uh, it deviates from the IPv6 header format quite a bit. Uh, also, there is uh, some amount of local uh, knowledge uh, that is stored in the uh, uh, end node to reconstruct the header information. Um, and we felt that uh, if, we, if we want to address six low and six low pan rather than do it in this draft, we would probably want to have a separate draft that looks at six low and six low pan. So uh, move it out just as we have done for IPv6. So that seems like a better approach of handling things rather than cramming everything into uh, this draft, which looks at IPv6. Just one back, please. Yeah. Sorry, just wanted to. So we covered everything. Okay. Um, so uh, this is like the minimally standard form packet. Um, uh, so we have removed the definition of minimal standard form packet for IPv6 and IPv4, um, and because uh, mainly because there has been uh, no usage of it uh, of the concept in practice. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this was the other big topic, which was the uh, treatment of uh, 
uh, treatment of extension headers. Um, so uh, there are two camps in uh, in IPv6. One is uh, to allow extension headers and let the middle boxes uh, touch it, and the other one, uh, other camp says, you know, you should not touch it at all because uh, it violates. So there are, I think, as far as I know, there are implementations of both in the field. Uh, so there is no consensus, honestly, on this. So. Uh, the best, uh, after a lot of debate and um, um, discussion about this, we, uh, we thought that it was best to uh, point out the challenges and the drawbacks and then leave it to the implementers to actually figure it out what, what works for them. Because as I said, like, we have both implementations in the field. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are challenges uh, in the way which uh, extension headers are done, especially if the middle boxes touch the extension headers that can lead to excessive uh, processing time, which means the measurements are affected. So we thought that we'd point that out in the draft and uh, move on from that topic. Um, so this is the version two of the renamed draft. Uh, um, this draft has been around for a long time. Um, uh, it resolves all the open items, all of the uh, comments that were there on the list and uh, the WGLC has uh, started and uh, ended as well. Uh, the draft is considered to be stable uh, and all of the open requests have been handled. There's no additional feedback during WGLC. So I think I think we are good to go. So if you have any questions, I, I think me and some of the co-authors are in the room. We'll be happy to answer any questions if you have. Yeah, any questions on this draft? How many of you have read the draft? Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Nalini Elkins. Uh, I did want to make the point that we need, we do need to write the uh, an add-on six low draft. I know Vinayak said that, but that's something that's additional work that, that needs to be done. So let me just say. So probably have another draft okay. soon on that. But, but the intention is that um, we'd like to extend this to do to handle six low as well. Uh, yeah. So the, the the other question is uh, whether six low and six low pan does fall under pur the purview of IP IPPM. Uh, uh, so that that is that is the question I would have to you, as well. If it does, then it would make sense to uh, extend this, uh, and you know handle all of the like the header compression is the one of the biggest things that uh, raise. So, significant depart so the, the real question to me is, do, is there demand to actually do measurements with IPPM protocols for six low? And is there a demand to use this framework to describe measurements in six low environments? Yeah. And if there is, then we should write the draft. And if there isn't yet, then we should probably not worry about the draft until there is. Because yeah. it doesn't seem like, it seems to me just the amount of work that you'd have to do you have to go and understand six low, and you probably want the people who want to do the measurements with the stuff to to come and help. So, right, right. No, that that's a very very valid question. Yeah. yeah. So it did come Al Morton. It did come to Al Morton's attention um, that there were some folks who uh, were making measurements more of the I O A and M ilk on uh, six low kind of wireless networks, and um, and I think the work that's being talked about here is just defining. What is a standard form packet for these reduced right. header size compressed things? Right, and, and so it's it's just I think it's just that additional work that Viniac's uh, talking yeah. about. Okay, so I mean, yeah, if there's if there's interest in doing the work and there's interest in using the work, then yeah, go ahead and do it and send up a draft and we'll adopt it clearly. Yeah. But yeah. okay, All right. thanks. So this is hold on, let me come over here and have a look at this draft. In so working group last call is done. Um, it needs so it needs a shepherd then, right? I mean, we're done. We have no shepherd. Dot dot. Sorry, let me be more explicit about this question. Um, would anyone like to shepherd this document through the process? Who's not an author, preferably? So I saw one hand in the back um, who'd read it. Um, start, there. start there, yeah. Um, so we're basically looking for someone just to do a quick, uh, a quick write-up of sort of the process and the working group, um, and um, so that we can send that up, so that Spencer can read it and say, okay, yes, this looks like everything has happened. Um, 
Anyone? Going once, going twice. Okay, anybody who's looking at me is going to get the Neville is going to be the document shepherd for now. Sorry. <laughs> Um, actually, it's been a while since I've done one of these, so I'll just go ahead and I'll just go ahead and I'll do this. Um, all right, so this document now has a shepherd, um, and uh, I'll get a write-up done probably not this week, um, and then we'll go ahead and send it up to Spencer. Cool. So next is Al. Good morning, everybody. I'm Al Morton, and we've been working on a registry in the IPPM working group for a long time. And uh, this is actually the, the this title slide for the initial rent registry contents. Um, which I'm, I'm working on with uh, those uh, stately gentlemen. Uh, next slide. But the, the registry format is in this draft. And, and this time around, almost all the changes were in the initial contents, the one I put up first. Uh, there's always some implications for the registry uh, format. So we're just going to take that ahead. Please go. All right, very quick summary. Um, the problem was, how do we summarize our metrics in a very precise way? We, we've defined them very flexibly in IPPM. Uh, that was the intent, but when we want to use these things for uh, very precise, comparable measurements, uh, sometimes with great implications, like comparing uh, service providers, for example, uh, then we really want to nail down what's exactly being done. So um, we've, uh, we've got a registry that helps to do that. We also provide unique IDs and uh, detailed exposition of the methods and the metrics and so forth. Lots of references. Next slide, please. So uh, here's a quick summary. Uh, again, this is how the, the registry concept uh, was constructed. Uh, we're up to version 13 now. And so each entry is a row, and each row is indexed by an ID. We've got uh, uh, control and reporting protocols using a URI or the ID to identify the metric they're measuring. And uh, the next slide shows the categories and column headings. Thank you. So um, here's how it's organized. Summary, metric definition, methods of measurement, output, and administrative info. Um, those are all the categories. And you can see the important stuff that sneaks in here now, the, the IDs, the names, the URIs, which include, which include a, a name and a URL. And um, then we have the metric definition with an explicit set of references. And then we start to talk about fixed parameters, the parameters that are absolutely going to be, they were completely flexible in the standards. But now we're going to nail those down to numeric values, typically, for the measurement to take place. Uh, the same thing happens with the uh, methods of measurement. Uh, we've got parameters there and so forth. That uh, Those are now nailed down. And then uh, eventually, we allow some parameters to be flexible, what we call runtime parameters. OK, so there's um, then the outputs, every kind of um, uh, result of the metric uh, is going to be nailed down, and that's a, an explicit list of things typically in the output. Um, there may be a reference method for calculations there as well. And uh, the units, uh, a method of calibrating the metrics if we have that, uh, administrative in info and comments. Next slide. Okay, um, so here's the updates. Uh, basically, We've uh, replaced uh, the Poisson. Uh, I said I said Poisson. There it is. Uh, uh, boy, Sarah hates when I do that. So it's Poisson. <laughs> we've replaced Poisson with uh, periodic metrics, and um, uh, that happened in, in several of them. There, uh, UDP round trip delay and loss. Uh, so new metrics for ICMP. This was a request from the last meeting. That's all in section nine. It's all going to be. Uh, round trip delay and round trip loss, obviously. Um, we've got these statistics, the min and the max and the uh, mean. Um, but I had to come up with a new sending discipline. This is like, this is, this is the sort of the third thing beyond um, Poisson and periodic. And um, uh, a lot of ping tools use something like a send on receive. Uh, I built this out of uh, the periodic stream. Uh, and, and with a max waiting time built into that as well. And, and so that should match what most ping tools do. Um, next slide. OK, so uh, you can quickly see how we're mocking up uh, the most important parts of the registry there. Um, and they are uh, 
the names and the URIs and the description. You won't be able to read this from the back, but you can see how the name changed when we changed the sampling discipline. It's now periodic instead of Poisson. Next slide. So here's what happened with the uh, registry format. We, uh, we had to update the registry that's got um, uh, the elements for naming. So fortunately, we already had ICMP and TCP, uh, but we've added the units of packets and packets per second. And in the output category, we've added count. And I already mentioned send on receive. That's also going to be a name element for the uh, sending discipline. Next slide. So we're up to slide nine now for those playing at home. Uh, so this is a look up, look at the uh, mock-up of the metric naming uh, sub-registry, which we'll use to help us uh, name things unambiguously. And um, they will all have uh, good definitions and descriptions and so forth. Uh, um, and, and you'll see today how we've reused a lot of these round-trip uh, uh, delay and loss uh, uh, metrics. Next slide. So the previous to-do list was uh, a question about the name element sets. Do they cover passive elements uh, well enough? And that, that question, asked at the last meeting, got converted into a request to prepare a new uh, passive metric for TCP round trip time. And uh, so we did that. We actually did a set of those. And that's in section 10 of the document now. So Brian uh, provided extensive uh, references uh, for that on the list. And uh, I really have to say thank you. Because I learned a lot about passive measurement uh, from, from reading those references. Uh, I've always been an active guy. <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, you know, we've, we've, but you can see where the interest is, because uh, this is where we've actually gotten some comments now. So it's, uh, it's kind of cool. Next slide. So the passive metrics. And this is where I want to spend the most time. That's why I've been rushing ahead here. Uh, we now, so we're, we're fairly sure that the registry accommodates passive pretty well, just because of the way the, the naming uh, worked. Um, we, had, we ended up some, with some new name elements, of course, uh, but that's fairly routine. Every time we uh, look at a new class of metrics, we found you know, a couple of things that had to be added to the naming element. So that's why we made that a separate sub-registry. It's working very well. So here's the new metrics, round trip delay, passive, IP, TCP, um, the RFC that uh, uh, specifies the, the metric. Uh, it's going to be in seconds as the units. And then uh, there will be separate ones for each of these statistics, the mean, max, and uh, the minimum. And then loss is just a packet and a count of losses. I think that's the best way to go with this. So um, well, next slide, Brian. So here's the game board. Um, when you're measuring TCP uh, round trip time, uh, we've taken the position in this method that you are a um, uh, sort of a mid-path observer. And according to Brian's uh, reference there, uh, inline data integrity signals for passive measurement, uh, that means that you have to split the round trip time measurement in half. So you measure the reverse uh, direction and the forward direction. You'll end up adding those together. So fortunately, we've got composition functions in, uh, in IPPM. We, can, we referenced things there. Uh, to be able to put these two measurements together and to do that. And you also notice a little delay there between the, uh, between the sender uh, receiving the first acknowledgement and then uh, subsequently pushing out the, uh, the next packet to the, uh, to the receiver. And that is uh, sort of a source of error, which we've identified. It's kind of the application uh, not sending immediately. So that's going to be a, a, an additional time that's viewed in the RTT uh, reverse direction. Next slide. So. Uh, I've sort of concluded that there's no standard uh, metric and method in any RFC so far for uh, passive TCP measurement. So I, I looked at all the references that Brian sent and wrote one. And now that huge, uh, not huge, but several page long uh, uh, metric definition and method of measurement with heuristics is in the registry entry. So there's a lot to look at there. Um, Let's see, anything else? Uh, yeah, the, the heuristics are really important because um, uh, it, it's, you know, in, in passive, you're looking at things and, and you're, you're uh, trying to make the measurement as correct as possible. Uh, things can go wrong, like the, like the little delay thing I just described. And um, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, one of the choices I made was that all these uh, statistics would apply to a single TCP connection. So uh, we look for the SYN, the SYNAC, and the ACK. Uh, that actually helps us to describe the nomenclature. So in the, the metric definition, you've got a host A, which is the uh, sender in the previous picture, and a host B, which is the, uh, the one that's um, uh, generally the receiver. And, and that's defined by who sends the SYN. 
okay? And, and a thin, thin ac uh, uh, pairs uh, would terminate the connection. They'd also terminate the measurement interval, assuming we see those. So uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, there are some open issues here, and, and this is worthwhile quickly discussing today. Uh, so if you search the draft for the uh, quad at, you will find them. Uh, so really, still no standard metrics? <laughs> Nobody looked this up while we were uh, going through that slide? Okay, well, well then we'll just go with what we got. <laughs> uh, so one question is, uh, in IPPM, we've always defined delay as, as from the first bit of the packet observed on the wire to the last bit of the packet observed someplace else on the wire. And um, do we want to keep that convention here? I, I think, I mean, I think we could, but I'm not sure that passive um, really gives us enough information to provide that kind of timestamp. So that's an open question. Uh, no, no. Okay. Well, then so, would. So I'm at least up at the the layer. You know, when you're dealing with TCP, at that layer, you pretty much will get packet level timestamps, not bit level timestamps. Kind of what I thought. All right. So that, but that's you could you could you could fake it. Yeah, but you probably shouldn't. Yeah, so let's not fake it. Let's just say uh, uh, can't do that here. All right, good enough, and and that's worthwhile mentioning. Great. Um, so so that's a so that's a feedback for the draft. Um, I I I, I kind of think that the round trip delay that's measured on the sin synac ac uh, three way handshake uh, that that's a good metric to separate out on its own. I'm, I am uh, suggesting in the method that we measure it but I didn't pull it out as an output parameter uh, or, or, or result. So I think that we should do that. I, I think that uh, that's a reasonable thing to do. Any, any feedback on that? All right. But, well, so then I'm going to have to flip the slides, I guess. <laughs> no, we're going to stay on this slide for a while. Um, <laughs> no, hi, uh, Brian Trammell speaking as an individual. Um, so I think it's a very, very, very good idea to take the um, sin synac ack out as a separate metric um, for a number of reasons, an unbounded number of reasons. I don't want to count them yet because I'm not. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, unbounded reason number one is that uh, in a lot of cases the handshake um, is going to be treated differently than other packets in a flow, right? Like you may have additional delays based on the fact that a load balancer needs to figure out how to take a five tuple and assign it to something or state that's getting ripped along the path as you as you um, send that sin, because sins yep. are special. Yeah. Um, the second reason is that uh, this is, doing this metric definition for TCP lays the groundwork for doing def metric definitions for other transport protocols. And for example, it is an open issue in QUIC um, uh, there'll be a report, I think, tomorrow from the RTT design team, which you may have heard of since you're on it. So am I. I have. Um, <laughs> that uh, basically says, well, we need to have a discussion about whether or not we want to make this running um, uh, passive RTT measurement of quick possible or impossible. Um, and if that is made impossible, we still have the um, handshake RTT. That'll that'll almost certainly stay in there. Yeah. So having a this split out into two metrics so that we can go and update it and say, okay, for quick, you just basically do the same thing except for the heuristic for determining whether it's a handshake isn't sin, sin, ack, ack. It's client initial, um, uh, server, um, clear text, client clear text um, without zero RT. I mean, the, the, the heuristics end up being a little bit hairier, but it's you can still define them. It would be really useful to have this as a reference for that work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that reminds me. Um, let's add uh, quick to the naming element. Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. And then also, as an individual, I will um, review this section. Please do. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's my it's my first attempt at this. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, uh, Rachel uh, from Huawei um, uh, read the draft. Thank you for your comments, Rachel. And she uh, suggested that we also uh, pull out round trip delay forward and round trip delay reverse as being uh, useful metrics as well. So um, I think that's that should be fairly easy to do. Nalini. Um, yeah, Nalini Elkins. Um, you know, one thing it sort of occurs to me, you know, especially in, in hearing Brian and the handshake, a lot of times the first N number of packets of us, you know, as we've talked about, are, are different. And some of them is, of course, the TCP SIN SIN app. But then, especially now that with TLS, 
you've got, you know, the first X number also. So I just, I, I just wanted to throw that out, not to confuse the issue, but, yeah. you know. No, you're right. You're right. Watch out behind you. <laughs> and and um, so actually, I think I said that in the draft, that these are special, and it's one way to do it. Rachel. Yeah, a uh, sensible, uh, this useful uh, metrics, and we really interested in that because, um, you know, when our um, um, implementation in the real uh, products or something, we found that uh, the, in the standard world, uh, we really lack this kind of uh, passing metrics for TCP. So, um, and uh, I'm very happy to see this uh, coming. Um, and uh, for the questions, and I, I really think that the, the, the delay for the, you know, uh, uh, sync and act should be a, a separate metric. And also, as I uh, suggested in the main list, that, uh, you know, uh, the R, uh, RTD forward and uh, RTD received uh, should, uh, could be separate because uh, we are using it for uh, uh, troubleshooting or di diagnose um, uh, use cases. Okay. So what what statistics be. would you be interested in seeing there? Um, um, uh, what, uh, like we got min, max, and mean for, for um, the overall round trip delay. Uh, uh, um, average, average. Average, okay. Yeah. All right. That, that makes it, it makes it simpler if we just do one. Yeah. So let's just do one. All right. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, next slide. It, it needs review, folks. Um, thank you, uh, Rachel, and for anyone else who has. Um, yeah, hands, hands for reviewers for this. Okay, I see like four or five that are, okay, cool, excellent, Great. thanks. Thank you. Um, so, uh, basically all the sections have been updated uh, nominally, and then uh, nine and, and 10 are the ICMP and passive TCP uh, respectively. Um, looking for feedback on all of this, you know, I mean, people are gonna have to implement these and uh, be happy with it and, and, and be comfortable that there's no ambiguity now when you're making these measurements. So, uh, review. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we still got to sort out something with DNS, uh, the, the loss, DNS uh, uh, loss um, metric. Uh, do, we, do we require that the method um, uh, generates an ID and puts it in the me message, uh, the query actually, or, or do we uh, uh, choose a different source port for every query so that we can disambiguate two successive uh, query attempts. Um, looking for feedback on that. Uh, so, oh, somebody? Yes, please. Thank you. So I have a I have a question about the. Um, I actually haven't read the most recent version of this. Um, with respect to the DNS response time, do you get? You're basically looking for DNS response time for a specific RR, or you're looking for a DNS response time where you get to encode information in the RRs. I think it's a specific RR. Okay, because one of the ways that um, people tend to do DNS-based measurements. So Jeff Houston has this has this um, really beautiful, incredibly elaborate DNS measurement oh. thing where he, you know, is using um, advertising. He has ads do DNS lookups, and he's doing a, a bunch of measurement based on that. And he's actually using the thing that he's querying for to encode the information, mm. right? So, okay. um, and. Because you get to query sort of like sub, or, or I mean, you can query sub names of names. There might be. Um, so the question, so I, the question is, what's the requirement here? Is the requirement here is that you need to look at response time for a specific RR, right? Like I care about www.google.com, for example, or is there? Are you looking to measure the response time of the DNS infrastructure, where, for example, you'd want to make sure that the RR that you're querying isn't cached somewhere, in which case you would be encoding information in the query itself. Ah, ah, that's an interesting distinction to the cache. Yeah. So I think I think here for this open issue, we need to like step back a little bit and figure out what it is exactly we're trying to measure. Are we trying to measure user experience for the DNS component mm. of some um uh of you know of some larger transaction or are we looking to measure the performance of the DNS infrastructure itself because that changes the, first, the answer I think I think it's the first one more like uh, what's the user experience kind of thing right. so, so, so the, I would think it would so be the, the second one, is one okay. but yeah, yeah. yeah well so yeah it, it could but it maybe could we be, want both but, but yeah all right yeah both so what's this metric about is if the metric is about the first one then yeah we need and I think I mean the the, the problem we're trying to uh, solve here is from a registry point of view there there hasn't been a nailed down method to do this 
right. uh, for these measurements. Yep. So um, given that there's value in both of those, let's let's nail that down for both. So that's another action item for uh, the registry. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll just quickly mention that the trace route, we've got a route metric proposed. You'll see more about that and, and many methods of measurement, actually. But fortunately, the draft is going to really nail that down fairly exactly. So we're, we're in much better shape when we finally get around to registering that. Next slide. Yeah. Oh, and just to mention that we were asked about a year ago, I think, or maybe a little more than a year ago, uh, to investigate uh, how the model-based metrics would fit in the registry. And so Matt and I did a draft on that, which we haven't updated in a while. And, and Matt thinks that we still need to do quite a bit of work on it. But the, but the bottom line is we should add this to the rest of the first crop of metrics when, we, when, we, uh, when, when Matt and I are comfortable with it, and so are you. Um, so that's just mentioning the, the status. I think that's it for me. I, I, I don't think I have to uh, trouble the working group with any other questions. OK, I would ask at this point, does the working group want to trouble Al with any questions? <laughs> um, I, we're up here assigning him um, additional metric work to do, so he's here, so you can make him do more stuff. And, and actually, I'm getting pretty good at this. Uh, I find now that I can really bang out a, a registry entry, <laughs> which is really detailed, but I can, I can do it pretty quick. <laughs> okay, no more homework for Al. Oh, yes, here comes Rachel. Okay. Uh, can I ask uh, what the decision for the XR block, XR block, RGCP XR? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that one, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, I, like I said on the list, uh, I prepared that a long time ago to prove that it yeah. could be done. It's not in the right form, and I think the question I asked on the list was, what do we really want to measure that RTCP XR uh, provides? I mean, I just chose uh, uh, the burst and gap uh, as, yeah. as something to do because of something I was familiar with. Yeah. Uh, but but if we want to do something else there, then make that suggestion on the list. Okay. I, I would say that's home, that's homework for you, Rachel. Go back and think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree because you know for XR block uh, for RTCP something like that, they all uh, define some you know the, the report block um, uh, protocols, right? They it sends the RTCP XR to report these metrics, but the met metrics registration, I'm not sure if it should be consistent with this format or not. Yeah. But people are think it, it is useful. I think I can provide some inputs to that. OK. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. So that's it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Next is Frank. So I'm just going to go do the, the very brief intro. All right, so this is a probably now that I know this not going to go cut it. This might cut it. Yeah. Right, so this yeah, that was more for Al, not for me. Um, all right, so um, quick update on on IOEM and um, next slide. Uh, so from a from an overall um, editorial perspective, there were relatively few comments. Um, most of the consolidation really happens across GitHub, so people raise issues there as opposed to on the list. I'm always trying to provoke that, take it to the list as well, and well, in many cases that happened. Uh, there were a couple of smaller things that uh, came up um, that we cleaned up. Um, well. Where is MSB? Is it bit this one or that one? So we harmonized that with the remainder. Um, but there weren't any real other things that needed to go get cleaned up uh, from an editorial perspective, which brings me to two discussion topics, uh, which is why we have John and Mickey here. Um, come along. Next slide. I don't know which one is first up. Um, ah, yeah, well, there was one thing that, that Mickey raised. Um, on uh, on GitHub as an issue, um, we don't really include data length as part of OPEC uh, stage a snapshot that needs to get cleaned up. Uh, there is even a pull request in there. We just need to go and hit um, OK right after the meeting. Uh, so we could have done that, but that usually confuses people if you publish an O2 right Monday morning. Yeah. Um, so we decided not to do that. Um, and 
then we go into the media discussion around uh, what John wants. Next slide. Um, he basically wants another timestamp format, and I might have John make the case for that rather than me. Hi, John Lemon. Uh, we have uh, people that want to be able to run NTP either because they can't or won't run PTP. And we, uh, we would find it very useful if we could carry timestamps in either format. Uh, it, so this is proposing adding NTP in addition to PTP and letting the user choose one or the other and indicating by the bits which type of timestamp is included. Uh, this has been discussed on, well, sort of discussed a little, not much on the, on the list and uh, previous GitHub poll that needs to be updated uh, also. Next slide. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, yes, uh, Greg Mirsky, ZT. Um, why you need to have uh, indication of separate seconds and uh, nanoseconds or fraction seconds uh, rather than just have one indication whether you have uh, PTP format or NTP format. Why not to do it one place? Well, my original proposal actually was to just include one or the other and assuming that you would, uh, that the entire domain would all be running the same type of timestamps. But I've been uh, told that that is a false assumption and that there are some servers that need to be able to communicate with uh, users that are using NTP and some or clients uh, using PTP. And so it would actually be handy to be able to have both transpiring at the same time. And this would allow the server to figure out which of their, uh, no. uh, which is being used. Yes, uh, but uh, again, uh, could somebody give a case where you have uh, PTP time, uh, PTP style seconds and NTP style fractional seconds? I can oh, oh, I one. see what you're saying. Why not combine the two of them? Right. Uh, because they're already separate elements, seconds and uh, seconds. Um, again, uh, I can give example on uh, TWAMP test uh, enhancement that we use just one bit to indicate the format, whether it's uh, PTP or N NTP. And you don't need to separate portions. You might have different uh, length of their timestamp. That's true. Well, but because it it's, will possi be it's possible to include just the seconds portion or just the subseconds portion uh, and doesn't with IOAM. No, but doesn't matter. You still say this is this format and this is that format. You yes. would not set two formats in the same timestamp. So are I, you, are I see you... it's just one binary flag. Yeah. and. Uh, that's certainly possible. It would require using some extra bit somewhere else to indicate which no, type. No, but if, 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 if you propose to use four bits here, yes. two, three, twelve, you can all get in one bit. I save you three bits. Uh, I, I, yeah. No, but again, the pro okay, if you will say that we don't support it, that's capability. You can do advertisement in a control plane capability. You don't need to do it in a packet. You just say, okay, I don't put timestamps, period, don't look at me, okay? Uh, and that will be control plane. But it's timestamp format. I don't see the combination that it's really needed because to me it looks over complication. Just my opinion. I think you're asking for a fundamental change to how the data is encoded in IOAM. Yes. Okay. That would uh, be... Is it a fallacy? <laughs> okay. Shweta Sisko. Um, indication of PTP, I mean, we, we need a bit type to indicate that we need to include the timestamp in the, in the per packet uh, control. But uh, whether it is PTP or NTP, given that uh, IOM is going to be defined for domain, I don't think we'll have a mix of PTP and NTP uh, nodes that would differently insert the timestamp. So it's more like a control global flag, which doesn't have to go in per packet. So um, while we leave the bits to say that seconds and nanoseconds need to be collected, but uh, the, form, the synchronization protocol itself is a 
more of a control global flag that doesn't have to go in a per packet. Uh, the reason uh, that I, I tried to explain before is that you might have a node that is running both NTP and PTP so that it can communicate on two different timing domains at the same time, and it needs to be able to accept a timestamp in either NTP format or PTP format depending upon who it's communicating with. But but would it be responding to two different IOM domains at the same time? And does yes. it have to be a... Yes. But, but, but still, right, uh, given that node ID and other stuff that needs to go in uh, uh, as a control uh, um, mechanism to the node, uh, this could also be uh, conveyed on a per IOM domain uh, when it when the control uh, plane is setting it up rather than in a per packet basis. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You can just take the mic down. Hi. Yeah. All right. And I'm... Um, uh, hi, uh, Brian Trammell speaking as an individual. Um, so uh, the general um, the general requirement here, I, I strongly and wholeheartedly support, um, especially because we've also done this in DWAMP and in a lot of other places where we've made assumptions about we're only going to use a single kind of timestamp and that bites us and now we do NTP and PTP, right? So this is consistent with the rest of the work in the working group and I applaud it. Um, I have spent a lot of time trying to do analysis on data, um, um, timestamps from um, providers such as a system like this that did it wrong. So I have very strong opinions about um, this seems dangerous to me in ways that you may not be looking at, right? So there's a there's a, a well-known problem with trying to, to um, uh, interpret timestamps in, in NetFlow version 9 because it basically has uh, a two fields internally that it uses for counting for the time base. It uses the um, seconds and the um, fractional seconds, and they just don't export the fractional seconds, right? So you can end up in a situation where you're using sort of like times that reference other times, and you just truncate the time, and now you have um, you know one second of error that you have to like do heuristics to guess. So I can kind of I can kind of see where you might want to be in a situation where you would turn off bit you have bit two on and bit three off, or bit twelve on and bit thirteen off. Um, the other combination, bit 12 off and bit 13 on, right? Like, so NTP fractional seconds and only NTP fractional seconds without a second base seems really weird to me. It seems a little bit less weird to me for PTP because, you know, in that case, you really are, like, actually sort of, like, down at the metal caring about nanoseconds. Um, I think, so Frank's probably going to say something that's, you know, similar but different. I think you should probably take all of this feedback and, and come back with a different, um, either a different design um, suggestion or a different or a set of design rationales as to why this is here, because there are trade-offs in this space, right? We like can't do it perfectly, um, and I'm not convinced that this is the optimal point in that trade-off space. Thanks. So Frank Rockners, um, so I think I second some of what what Brian was saying. Um, so when we started off with IOM, we on purpose picked a dedicated namespace for virtually all the fields for IOM. Uh, why? Because we didn't really want to go and be bound to some parent protocol and the associated format. Because whenever you do that, somebody else will show up and say, I want this as well. And then you suddenly have probably 128 bits of bit field to indicate, and it's still not yes. sufficient, right? So, yes. which is why I have a little bit of kind of allergy when I see that. At the same time, I second that there is use cases where you could have different nodes filling in things with different formats, and you want to go and indicate that. But you're not alone because there's other metadata typically inserted along with timestamp. I've not really seen a case where people just insert timestamp but no node ID. So if you indicate the node ID, you know what the node is capable of doing typically, whether it's using 1588 or NTP, but it's rarely seen, or maybe there is a use case, tell me, where the node would either insert 1588 or NTP depending on a particular use case. Really making things up here. If that's not the case, then we may not need that indication, but we can go with two fields 
And maybe what you're telling me is we're overly specific even in saying, well, it's seconds and nanoseconds. Maybe we just say, okay, there is two fields and you're free to go and populate them depending on what you need. Yes, um, but so, I wouldn't and, want and to... So I second basically okay. Brian's comment. I think you're raising a really good topic and a really good discussion, um, but it needs more thought on how we're going to go and resolve that. Because we don't want to be imperative from what we're doing from a formatting perspective uh, so that we are not going down the slippery slope of having eventually to accommodate the world of different formats, not yeah. only here, but you can take this over also to interface IDs or whatever, right? So then people say, I want this format and not that format. And well, we don't want that here. Yeah. Um. I think that uh, basically their uh, suggestion uh, to look at uh, this information being part of configuration and control plane uh, is uh, in a very good direction. And I think that uh, to me what it suggests is that should we look at the control plane of our IOM at, or and data model. So uh, again, it, their granularity. This, this is not probably only the question of uh, timestamp format. Yes, I agree that uh, a node can support both uh, formats, and that can be something that is either negotiated or just advertised, or the node is told that for this uh, data stream you use this uh, format, and because uh, node ID will be present. Uh, it would not necessarily require uh, information uh, in each data packet. Okay, okay, just a quick comment on that. You're, there's an assumption that node ID would be present, and we don't see that as necessary. We see that actually as uh, a, a burden, actually, to have to include the node ID, because uh, it adds lot to the header to process in, um, in, a, in hardware and yeah. uh, we're actually looking at and you also suggest relying on the control plane but again if we're trying to do this within the chip uh, trying to inject control plane information down into chip to figure out how to interpret the timestamps adds additional complexity to the hardware uh, okay um I think that probably uh, at this point it's better to take it offline okay. and uh, continue discussion on the list. Okay. Uh, but uh, then I definitely would like to understand their scenario when their uh, data metadata are not accompanying by some sort of uh, ID. Okay. Next slide. Um, in addition to wanting the uh, Oh right. Uh, so there's a there uh, meta, there's metadata that's available on the hop by hop basis that we would like to be able to uh, access on just edge to edge. Uh, while it's poss I mean, while it's possible to take all the information from hop by hop, add it up together, um, and come up with a total delay. We would prefer, in many cases, not to have to rely on every hop by hop measurement and instead just have an end-to-end -end measurement. And so uh, we're asking that there be timestamps, uh, the same timestamp information that's available on hop by hop to be available edge to edge. And uh, the second request with regards to edge to edge is uh, a 32-bit uh, sequence number either in addition to or instead of 64-bit. Um, again, this has to do with uh, ease of processing in the chip and uh, depth of uh, IOAM header into the packet. So for the edge-to-edge -edge timestamps, um, the current timestamp on hop by hop is ingress. Um, do you want ingress on both edges, or do you want something different at the end? I would, uh, we would want egress on transmission and ingress on reception. What it, is that what it says in the draft or in the proposed change? I don't recall if it specifies that. <laughs> Let's fix this forever. Um, so um, 
Frank Rockner's. So what might make sense if if you come up with proposed text and send that to the list for the two ones uh, so that we, well, are a little bit more specific on how things would, would work out. Um, I do believe that having additional edge-to-edge -edge options is not a problem. Um, it's relatively easy to do, um, so let's do it. Right, so I think of having short and long formats for sequence number, well, we do this for many other fields as well. Why not, right? And um, from a timing perspective, again, more detail would be beneficial. Okay, thank you. Take it to the list first rather than, I, I know it's easy if you put a push request or a pull request, but many people don't see it that way. And so kind of this this thing that, that we need to go and mimic things sure. on the list so that everybody has visibility of I, what happens on GitHub because not everybody watches the issues on GitHub. Okay. Yeah, and I have a I have a chair comment on the GitHub thing, but I'll do it at the end of this whole, I see there's other slides up here or? Okay. I, I don't read GitHub. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah Banks, I, I had a question. You keep referencing chip and easing things on the chip. And uh, my skin crawls a little because that sounds very vendor specific. So I'm just curious, what chip are you referring to? I'm re uh, not referring to any specific chip in general, but rather to uh, general implementation within silicon. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, not that tall. So um, one thing I uh, noticed while coding things up for the hackathon um, was that the current definition of the, uh, um, we have undefined bits in the IOM trace type but we do not say anything about what you're supposed to do either on um, transmission or reception of an undefined bit in the, in the IOAM trace type. And it's the reception one that is the issue of concern. Um, if you wanna be able to use those bits in the future, if you look at the way the encoding works, anytime you have a bit, you expect a data field after that corresponding to that bit. So ignoring the bit will not work. Um, if you're not adding the, the uh, info, but the bit is set, then it will not be parsable when you get at the other end. So we have to do something. Um, two obvious approaches. One is if an undefined bit is set, don't add anything at this hop. Uh, another possibility is to try to nail down the lengths right now, even for undefined bits. Obviously, that has some, some pitfalls, but it would allow you to at least insert everything with a proper length so that it can be parsed at the other, um, at the monitor. Um, and if anyone has any, anyone else has any bright ideas of better ways to approach this, um, happy to hear them. Uh, why can't we set it as reserved or experimental? Sound? No, so the, 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 the problem right now is if, if your implementation today, implementing this version, the bit is undefined and you ignore the bit, then you're not going to add that information into the packet. But when you actually pull the information out of the packet, every time you see a bit, you expect that the information from any one hop will include mm -hmm. that length of data for that bit. So if you just ignore it and you don't add the information to the packet, then when it comes time to read it, you will actually be thinking that info for this hop, it'll bleed over into the next hop, what the next uh -huh. hop did, and everything gets shifted, and you, you won't be able to parse it. Okay, um, Greg Mirsky, ZT. Um, so I, I really wonder, because if um, there is something undefined, which is like, uh, must be zero, right? So usually uh, in, a, in a document, we say, must be set to zero on transmission and ignored on reception. Yeah, and I'm saying you can't ignore on reception in this case. Why? No, if it's if it's MBZ, you should ignore on reception. Okay, so let me give a simple example. So if you have 
two, you're, you're implementing this version of the spec that it makes it to RFC. You go out, you implement it, off you go. Then in the, in the trace bits, you may say, I want um, node ID and interface IDs. So every hop would add node ID, interface ID, node ID, interface ID. When you pull all that apart at the end, you're going to assume that after every two bits, it's another hop. So the first two headers is the last hop, the no, next but... two is a hop before that, so on. Now, if later on we, we define some undefined bit, and now um, the source sets three bits, two of them that were previously defined, and one that's newly defined in a new version of this spec, then now the, the expectation when you get to the end is that every node is adding three fields, and uh -huh. it will go through the first three fields and assume that's the last hop. And three after that is a hop before that, and so on. If a hop actually only adds two fields, then you start mixing and matching. Well, what, then what, what, who is the actual source at any one hop, and 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 how you're interpreting it? So okay, so I understand. So you you uh, asking the question proactively. Uh, basically, yes. you are asking about how you ensure backward compatibility between versions. Yes. Yes. And uh, okay. So uh, I think that there uh, one way to do it is that you have uh, the record type embedded in your uh, metadata that you put in. So thus, uh, they can understand. Uh, basically, you have some TLD effectively, so you can parse it uh, without really relying that you have a fixed size records on your uh, uh, bits. Uh, another approach is that, okay, well, you know, it might be not backward compatible. And uh, third approach would be that this information about capability will be advertised in the control plane or data model, and then somehow will correlate to the packets that you receive. So uh, choose what you like. There's a lot of complexity in several of those answers, right? So I have a note uh, on what I said before. Uh, my suggestion is if they are, uh, you know, uh, set to reserved and someone set one in these reserved bits, I think the whole header should be ignored, not only one particular, uh, uh, you know, set of data. Yeah, so so that that was the, the uh, first suggestion was at any one hop, if you can support all the bits that are set, go add your data. If you cannot, don't add your data. Exactly, and also the receiver will ignore all the data that are in the data sets if one of the bits of the results set to one. No, but it has to be the node that's adding, right? Once once you get to the end, you don't know what happened. Yeah. No, but once you see a bit that has to be zero and is now one, you should, you know, not using anything there because you don't know what happened in the middle. Hi, Brian Drammel speaking as an individual. This is... um trying to count them. I've had this discussion before um, in a whole <laughs> lot of different protocols. Uh, and um, everyone does it a little different. And some of the reasons I think that they do it a little different is because they have different requirements. And some of the reasons just because it's like, oh, well, we, we haven't looked at what was done before. Um, I don't, uh, I'm not deep enough into how IOEM works to make a um, coherent suggestion here, but I'm going to make one anyway. Um, I think that so if you want an extensibility system to be used and useful, um, you basically need to set it up um, before you start, I mean like at, at, you know, before you start allocating code points in this code space, you need to set it up so that you know exactly what the, what the, the failure state is. And like, so, you know, for example, with the um, uh, uh, IPv6 extension header types, there was the attempt to say, you know, whether, you know, you know the must ignore bit and must forward bit and so on and so forth. Um, it seems here that the main problem is a problem of length, right? Of um, you must understand every bit in order to be able to figure out what your offset is when you're sending. Do I understand that correctly? It's an offset calculation problem. Um, well, not exactly because the, 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 the way that it's set up right now is it's more like a stack and you're always pushing yeah, your information right. in the front of a stack. So. The nodes that are adding info don't have any problem, right? They're, they're always oh, it's when you're ripping the stack place. apart at the end, right? Yes. So it's still an offset calculation problem, but it's not a sender offset calculation problem, it's a receiver offset calculation problem. Yes, exactly. All right. Um, 
yeah, then you either need to define a fixed length record per hop, and you know each hop just basically adds stuff until it runs out of things to add or out of space, or and then like maybe that's you know it's variable length, but it's fixed length for a given trace. Uh, or you need to basically have each code point in the space, even the reserved ones, define what their length is right now. And yeah. you have like you can have like a short variant and a long variant, and you just so this is when we yeah. when we hacked up um, uh, sort of the the thing that became plus, we ended up going with that. It's like you know, there's a bit here that says which bits, how what fraction of the bits here are integrity protected, for yeah. example. And it's that's, the same approach. That's what. That second approach seems to me to be the most. That's what that was trying yeah. to describe, and yeah. you said a more eloquent. Okay, okay, so I did, I, I did understand that correctly. Yeah, then I'm just in having looked at this problem mm -hmm. in other protocols in other spaces. The second one seems to be the most promising to me. Yeah. Uh, Hao Song from Huawei. Um, actually, we uh, wrote a draft. Uh, uh, maybe that might help to solve this uh, problem. Um, so in case one node can node uh, process or uh, add some data to the IOM header, it can uh, use a, uh, a extended uh, bit, uh, bitmap to indicate uh, val validation of the data. It can just uh, uh, reset that bit to zero to indicate this node will not add uh, valid data uh, to, to, to the IOM header. Uh, then. Uh, Obviously, this will require uh, we know the size of the, the data. Uh, uh, so maybe by default, we just uh, um, you know assume every every data type is just uh, 32 bits. So in that case, we just uh, add some um, maybe all app data to the uh, to the to the node, but set that bit map bit to zero to indicate uh, this node cannot uh, add any data valid data. So uh, this can help to uh, address this issue, I think. Oh, yeah. uh, Kyle O'Rose, Sandvine. Just a comment about the uh, 0xFF at the uh, mm -hmm. that option. One problem with that is it does limit the range of valid options for all existing types and all future types by one. I'm not, not really a big deal, but you know, if there is some type we want to define in the future and all possible values inside that type makes sense, then you might run into issues if 0xff is Yeah, at the moment, bad. we're doing that for some of the fields, but not all the fields. Yeah. What we have yeah. So anyway, I mean, we obviously we need to take this issue to the list. Um, I was just hoping for some feedback to see if we could narrow down to one proposal. Um, I think you I can got narrow some it down good feedback, list. but um, it's not one proposal yet. <laughs> Um, so, thank you very much. I have a chair comment about, um, uh, this is just something I noticed on the uh, uh, the GitHub repository. Um, there is an emerging de facto sort of method for doing um, the use of GitHub within a working group, like where basically the, you know, the repository gets moved over from um, whatever individual repository or individual organization into a working group organization, and also a standard for the arrangement of those, which is you know you need a uh, contributing file that points to the note well. That's the big thing. So if anybody comes in and looks at a GitHub repository from outside the IETF, they understand that contributions for this document have um, are subject to IETF IPR rules. Like that's the big thing that that we figured out. And I just looked at this repo, and it doesn't do that. Um, so we should, yeah, so we should get that fixed. Um, and I, you know, with my chair hat on, I have, since this work had a, a long independent life um, before it came into the working group, I don't necessarily need to have um, this as um, github.com slash IETF dash IPPM dash WG um, slash IOEM drafts. Um, but if there is interest in the future in moving some of the IPPM work into GitHub, I can go ahead and do that and we can make that happen. I don't care, but. So, Frank Rogers, how about we do that right now? We'll do it right now and then uh, say, because okay. there's yep. going to be more along yep. the same lines because, well, you you notice that we're starting the journey with all the various yep. protocol working groups to go and find a home for where to put the, the, the data fields. 
Um, so there will be more of the same. Yep. And rather than just continuing down the wrong path, and I think it's still early enough to go and switch paths. I will go ahead and set that up. So thank you. All right. So thank you very much. Um, we are going to. I'm going to. All right. Actually, I need to come over here and do this now. We're going to switch over to uh, the TMAP board discussion now. Um, which is really Yang model um, for reasons. Uh, thumbnail. Show me the thumbnail. Uh, this is all the way at the end. Isn't it? Does that look like that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. These are slides. Yes, that's the right place to start. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm Al Morton. I'm uh, uh, working with uh, Ruth Civil and um, Rashad Raman and uh, Mahesh Jethrandani and Costas Penacusis is our editor working on the Yang model for TWAM. Next slide. Uh, so here's a, a summary of our interim uh, progress. And uh, we had a working group last call and uh, there were no comments, but uh, there wasn't a call of the consensus of the last call. That's uh, something, uh, action point for uh, you or someone else in the chairman's seats. <laughs> um, I didn't. I didn't see any. I. I. I think there's consensus. Oh yeah, I think yeah. so too. But but, right. there, but there should be like a message that. Yeah, says I'll that. send that out. Yeah. Um, uh, so while we were uh, uh, working on on last call, we also had a re-review from our Yang doctor, uh, Jan uh, Lindblad, and um, we cleared up a few issues with him. And then uh, we had a review by our volunteer document shepherd, uh, Nalini Elkins. Uh, so thank you for taking that job, Nalini, and, and for volunteering uh, to do a big, it's a, this was a big, a big step for somebody who hadn't really read TWAMP before. So uh, much appreciation for, for jumping into the breach on this. Um, uh, Nalini did this incredibly um, uh, considerately in that she took everybody else's comments that had been raised like Jan's and, and others along the way Greg's and 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 said did you guys really resolve this you know show me the show me the way you did this and, and so almost everything that was uh, done against this draft for several years has been checked and uh, Nalini was finally satisfied with it um, so she published the, the, the link to the Shepherd's write-up and we immediately published uh, version 05 to fix a, a few uh, things, in, including the uh, Yang Doctor and, and uh, Shepherd uh, points. Uh, but then uh, Greg uh, Mursky here made a, a comment on the Shepherd write-up uh, draft, which uh, we continue to the next slide to take a look at. Mm, yes, and, and, it, and it really has a lot of relevance to this draft, which Greg and I put together uh, during the last meeting. Uh, on the uh, reassignment of uh, UDP port for the TWAMP test protocol. So uh, this really covers both these, these drafts, although this one's individual, as you will notice. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Greg was seeking to align uh, the dash ports draft, which you just saw the title screen for, uh, with the Yang model. And Greg proposed that we do all this, uh, add the, the range, um, including the UDP port, 862, plus the full dynamic range, and then to add a note that the that 862 would be the default, but uh, but then I said on the list, um, we've already got thousands of existing implementations that aren't going to recognize this as a default, so that's a kind of an issue. Um, we're, we're we're we can't do this uh, sort of retroactively, um, and I'm and I wasn't getting a mandatory default from reading this uh, sentence, which is at the bottom of the slide, um, but I realized that we could uh, probably clarify it, and Greg agreed that we should clarify it. And so then the, the proposal to clarify it went out on the list, which is on the, the next slide. So you've got the old sentence there for, for, um, uh, for reference. But what I did was to separate it into three items, which should be very understandable. The first sentence uh, basically just requests the reassignment to IANA, and it stops there. Uh, but now we qualify what that new reassigned port means to TWAMP. It's optional in standards track OWAMP and TWAMP. And then the last sentence uh, provides the future-looking uh, clarifications that we are hoping for. It may simplify some operations to have a well-known port available for test protocols and for future specifications involving TWAMP test to use this port as a default port. 
Any comments on that wording? I've already heard from Greg on the list that this is this is okay. I think, I mean, to be honest, I think I could connect it better uh, here, but um, but I uh, it, unless I'm really moved, I, I think I'm just going to put this uh, in the draft, our draft, and uh, and that will clarify the situation. So I think that's it, Brian. Or wait, there's next steps here. Oh yeah, uh, so next steps for the port draft. Um, assuming we can agree on the wording in slide five, um, then uh, which we just did, then then the only point raised for clarification was was it. Uh, that's everybody seems else seems happy with that draft, uh, unless there's some other ones coming up now to the microphone. The microphone is empty, uh, so the authors suggest a call for working group adoption of the TWAMP port draft. That seems. Um reasonable to me um, so uh, so this is this is it's difficult to do a call for adoption because this is a little um, this is slightly esoteric right yeah um, so uh, I, I'll ask who's read the draft and understands the um, the issue here port reassignment right yeah the port yeah. reassignment thing yeah okay yeah so that's like the number of hands we usually get for t stuff right um, yeah yeah <laughs> Um, so, uh, any uh, objections to adopting this as a working group item? None. Um, so, I say we just go ahead and put the call for adoption out on the list. Right. Uh, this seems like pretty much like a no-brainer to me. So, um, okay. and and I'll I'll push a uh, a revised version with this text in it that you can refer to in the uh, adoption call. Um, are there other updates that comes out of that come out of this that have to go back onto the the TMP Yang draft? No. So the so. so the um I just changed um the status to WG consensus waiting for write up right um which I should have done a while ago right um because we already have a write up so we're not technically right. waiting for a write up so I can click the button now and send that up to the IESG then. Um, one thing to fix here, which is the last the last three lines. So uh, next right. steps. Next yeah. steps for this. Um, so we we've, we've got the call consensus working group last call publication request, but um, we want to make port 862 optional in the model. And I think the way to do this is to add a leaf. Okay, so everybody's cool with that. All right. So we need a so we need an 07. Yeah, uh, six actually six. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, my understanding that if uh, the range will be enhanced by use uh, listing 862 or range actually it will make it optional okay uh, that's I guess that's a different way to do it the or uh, well, okay if, if we can go back to the uh, my proposal so yeah. uh, too far yeah there it is there it okay is. so if uh, range statement acceptable that makes it optional just drop default use range and that makes it optional so the last, the default 862 goes away. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. 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 Okay. I don't know enough about Yang, but if you say so, that. Um, well, so, so let's. Okay. No, no. Don't take my word, but. <laughs> no, I, I think. I, that's I, my understanding. Yeah. Okay. And, but when I talked to the co-authors, they suggested two separate leaves. So, I, I, yeah. I, all right. So we'll work this out. Work it out. Yeah. Um, work it out. Send a, send an extra rev, and then we'll um, request pub. Because, okay. I mean, this is. This is so down in the weeds that this, yeah, oh, I yeah. don't think yeah. that there's. But, but it's important to get right. If anybody, if anybody decides that um, that you know, the particular Yang implementation here means that they are no longer um, uh, comfortable with having working group consensus on this, then please raise that concern on the list. Otherwise, this is the plan we'll go with. Yeah, good. Thank okay, you. cool. Thanks. Um, next up is Al. Right. All right. Hold on. I need to. Oh, no, I did not mean to. Backup slides. That's starting to look this like my here. stuff. There yeah. We go. Ah, okay. So this is an individual draft on uh, the advanced uh, unidirectional uh, route assessment. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> uh, uh, Ignacio 
and Al and uh, Joachim uh, Fabini have all been working on this. Uh, this is our second version. Uh, so we're, we're, we're trying to get this to where the working group likes it enough to adopt it. Uh, and and uh, Carlos Pinataro suggested this acronym by just recognizing it. It was already in the uh, title, Aura. Uh, sounds pretty good. I think we'll, we'll insert that in a uh, future uh, draft name if we're successful with adoption. Next slide, good. All right, so here's the background. Um, we developed a root metric, and we uh, introduced it uh, before ITF-99. We got Rudiger Guide's comments, uh, which became our initial to-do list, seven items. Uh, we've addressed pretty much all of those now, and um, had some replies on the list. So that's all that uh, sort of thing is, is in 01. Uh, but then in the interim, um, after the meeting, we got extensive comments from uh, Carlos Pignataro. So uh, thank you for those. When, you, when we get to the to-dos, you'll see a lot of things that are labeled CMP. Those are all addressing Carl's comments as well. Um, but many of them have, uh, have been addressed. Uh, so several remain, though. Some we're going to discuss today. So there's actually going to be some real interaction here. Get ready for it. Um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about expanding the scope. That's a big deal. Um, Off-list comments from Frank Brockners. Do you remember reading this, Frank? <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, so anyway, thanks for that, and thanks to all the reviewers, really. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a brief presentation here, so if you want to see all the diffs, that, there's a link to them right there. Uh, thanks to all the reviewers. Next slide. So um, major update, um, the hops. Uh, we originally described each route as an ordered graph. So that meant that our, our source, source host uh, was in this nomenclature uh, zero, 01. And then you encounter a list of hosts along the, the path, and you, you identify them all according to this numbering system. And then at the end of the path, you, you eventually get to the destination. So the, basically, the, the path was defined as existing between a given source uh, identity and a di different uh, destination identity. And of course, multipath means that you can have different subpaths along the way. So that meant that we had to have something called a root ensemble, which I will get to. But, uh, but, <laughs> but the most important thing was that we originally referred to this, these HIJs as hosts. And what we quickly found in um, uh, looking at the methods of IOA and M and uh, some other things that are around is that there's additional information available at every hop. And I've got it listed there. It, it has to include a host identity, but it may also include an arrival interface identification, same for departure arrival timestamp, we were just talking about formats for that, uh, round trip delay measurements, which are measured elsewhere but still can be put into this tuple. Uh, there's other things too, MTU, uh, Q state, lots of things could be really measured here that, uh, that and different interrogation protocols uh, tend to make these things possible. So what we've done is really to expand our, um, our representation of what's being measured to include all this information as a possibility. And that's a big step. I think that we've, we've now covered a lot of um, a lot of new information that's available beyond the old uh, trace route methods, and uh, will be available in the future. So, uh, next slide. So the also uh, we've had we have an update which is a foundation for all these three components. Uh, so we've identified a host identity as uh, the addresses the host reveals when communicating. It, it's under normal and error circumstances. Um, a discoverable host is one that corresponds to the uh, requirements in these RFCs listed, 1122 and 1812, and it sends a basically sends an ICMP time exceeded message when discarding a packet due to TDL expiration. Uh, so that's discoverable. Now, uh, a cooperating host is one that's participating in uh, an, an interrogation protocol, like IOANM, for example, and uh, it must respond with identity. Uh, into the interrogation should provide the other info, and so, uh, and one of the things we've done with all of these uh, identif identified uh, components is that we've used the RFC 2119 terms to say what they must and, and should uh, do, uh, and we feel that we can we can generalize all these components uh, beyond IP if necessary, and that's really one of the suggestions that come in uh, from Carlos, which we've begun to discuss on the list. So next slide. Here's the interactive portion. Be, uh, put your PCs away. Let's get ready to talk about this. Um, the, the proposal is, should we expand our scope beyond IP? Um, it's the IPPM working group. 
It means that our framework was really strongly based on IP wear measurements. But there's so much uh, good synergy with the tools and uh, the additional information that can, can come from LSP ping and LSP trace route and, and some of the other uh, nicely constructed features that are available now in, in MPLS uh, wide area networking um, that we could easily expand our definitions here, sort of generalize them and include uh, MPLS uh, routes and, and uh, in this work. So uh, open mic now. <laughs> Greg. Okay, uh, great idea. But uh, why not generalize even further uh, not just MPLS ping stray route, ping and trace route, because we are discussing ping and trace route functionality for all different overlays, like NVO3, SFC, beer. I, I, so I think, and many, and many of them is which, what's important in this work is they're uh, natively unidirectional. Yeah, yeah, and that's what we've got here. Is it right, advanced? exactly unidirectional. So generalize, go just ping trace route functionality on different networks and uh, uh, overlays. So I, so I think, uh, good point, and, and it's actually what I mentioned here and what Carlos also also mentioned, NVO3, um, there's a, a Facebook UDP thing that, that's out uh, there. Yeah, it's a, a GUI, generic UDP encapsulation. Uh, and segment routing allows uh, some delay measurements uh, as well. Um, Yes, segment routing, again, uh, segment routing has uh, two uh, data planes uh, for MPLS and IPv6. Uh, but at the same time, so we have uh, beer, actually, and beer is interesting because it's a multicasting technology. So, so here's, here's here, I, I appreciate that there's lots of ways we could attack this. I think that, and, and lots of uh, protocols and underlying technologies that could be included. What I'd like to do and propose to the working group now is, okay, <laughs> what I'd like to propose is that we, we take on MPLS, we simultaneously write the definitions for standard formed packets at the MPLS layer, okay? Because in order to measure round trip delay and loss, and the other things that, that uh, Ignacio was proposing we do here, we kind of have to include them in our framework, and that's the way to do it. I don't think that's that hard, though. And, and, and in the, just to let me finish, and so in the, and, in, and by generalizing to MPLS, I think we'll actually create a frame, framework where we can add methods easily from any, uh, any of these other technologies which would be, uh, which would be available. Yeah. Um, for MPLS, uh, definitely we need to look at 6374, uh, which is a, a packet loss and, and delay measurement in MPLS networks. 6374. Yes. Um, uh, just to note is that um, in uh, MPLS um, control message already has, uh, for the ping, uh, timestamps. So, uh, right. Right, and, and that's, that's oops, sorry. That's exactly, yeah. that's exactly why I was trying to do this. But, yeah, and but, but uh, if, actually what, what would be very helpful and valuable is uh, recommendation because uh, for some other networks, uh, there is a consideration whether include the timestamp and what, uh, how many timestamp, how much of a space for the timestamp to include. Mm. Because uh, I, I agree with you that if we're doing a unidirectional timestamp, we don't need to have more than one timestamp uh, filled. Uh, it looks like we need to have a charter discussion, though. Uh, <laughs> that might be what the chair is telling you by yes, taking by, your slides off and putting the charter up. Yes, and, um, and, and, and highlighting a specific sentence. And highlighting a specific sentence. I uh, decided <laughs> I wanted to be ready for this. Right. So, um, actually, Nalini, you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. My, yeah, mine isn't from the charter, but it's back to your, your draft. I mean, if you are talking about, um, I suppose, expanding, everything um, uh, in your draft was really talking about TCP, UDP, as the transport and not taking into consideration, you know, other transport protocols. Is that is that your intention? Well, well, that that would be that was that was what Carlos proposed in his extensive comments, and and he saw that we had um, basically the features to be able to cover these in terms of a metric, 
but we hadn't quite gone there yet. Although a lot of the new work uh, that I did, like defining these components and so forth, that's, that's I, I think, now generalizable so that we could easily make the jump if we had to. I mean, basically, all, the, all the, the work on O1 in the metric definition uh, was looking, looking ahead toward possibly doing this. Yeah, sure, because I can definitely see, you know, if you do a SCTP and then, or heaven forbid, quick, you know what I mean? Is if that is a transport protocol, right? Well, actually, I think, I think where we're headed is down. Uh, down and not across. Well, I, I can, I can, I can, I, I can, I can talk, I can talk to that point a little bit later. In fact, um, yeah. So let's let's cover this though. Yeah. Um, so this is our charter, which we just redid. <laughs> um, nice. And uh, so individually, I really like this idea because I think that, you know, basically it, it one of the things that we've, so the, the, the IETF is, is basically structured in a way that there's like, you know, layer three and below and layer three and above and never shall between meet. Um, but uh, the way that networks are run right now, um, like everything's an overlay over an overlay and a tunnel over an overlay. And um, you actually, in order to be able to understand it, uh, you need to not quite have this strict layering idea in how you measure it. Um, so, but we have a charter and the charter says this. And the um, standard formed MPLS packet seems to be such a blatant violation of the charter that we'd have to recharter to do it. Yeah. However, if I may, before the before the the area director cuts me off. Um, oh, please continue. <laughs> if I may, um, the end goal of all of this measurement is to determine the quality, performance, and reliability of internet data delivery services and applications running over transport layer protocols over IP. That's the end goal, yeah. right? We yeah. care about what's going on in the tunnel or over the tunnel or through the substrate um, because we care about what happens to the packets over it. Yeah. So it's, it's the work to generalize the route metric seems to be defensible. The work to um, say, here's how you apply it to MPLS, and here's what an MPLS standard foreign packet looks like, seems like it might need a recharter. Okay. Do you have a, a an opinion or an alternate opinion on that? Uh, so Responsible let me do, area let me, director? Let me do the low order bit first, uh, which is there's different styles of managing working groups. One is the one where you come up with the, work, the charter and then never change it until it is so obviously out of date that no one will come to your working group anymore. Um, and the other one is to keep it up to date as, as things develop. Uh, I'm actually OK with keeping something up to date as new work arises and you know, that is at the edge of the scope. You know, that, that's actually, that seems like to me, responsible uh, working group management practices. Thank you and Bill for that. We're moving to the high order bit. Um, I'm going to be an area director for right at about 500 more days. So I'm starting to think about what I'm leaving behind. Uh, it seems like to me that what matters is what work needs to be done and whether we can assemble a community to do it. That might be here. That might, you know, I mean, you know, I actually had this question about uh, Institute OAM. Is this going to be so big that it swamps everything else the working group is trying to do? Uh, I'm not saying that it does. It, I mean, we charted it the way we did, but that was my first thought. Uh, so uh, my, my thing is, this might be the right place. This might not right be the right place. I'm fine with figuring out whether the work needs to be done. And then we can figure out where it needs to happen. Because if it needs to happen, that's, you know, that's an ISG responsibility. So make sure that we do the work that we need to do for the internet. So let me, let me make a suggestion as the chair. Okay. Let me say that let's, um, So the fact that we're the fact that we've we've traditionally solved these problems in different ways in different spaces, and now we're 
doing less of that with the bringing of, I mean, that was sort of an explicit goal of bringing IOEM into this working group. It is, worked. And it seems to have worked. Um, is that this work on sort of the topology metrics is generalizable and it should be built in a generalizable way. But I would say that for right now, we develop it with an eye toward the present framework. Okay. Um, with the understanding that um, we don't want to do anything that, you know, we're understanding now that we're not just, you know, it's just like down to the first IP header and then we don't care anymore. We might want to care below the first IP header. We know that now. We didn't know that when 2330 was written. Right. Because right. the internet wasn't made of tunnels yet. Right. Um, or ECMP for that matter. <laughs> so I would say, like, basically, go go ahead with the route as you're doing it. Yeah. We now know that we might need to to um, extend 2330 further um, after we have the route work done, but let's do the route work first. Okay. In a generalizable but still focused above IP way. That okay. would be my suggestion. So generalizable but still focused on. Yeah. IP. I would support that as area director. So okay, thank cool. you. All right. Carla Pina, Carla Pinataro, Cisco. Um, thank you all for bringing this discussion to the working group. Uh, you know, my main goal of this discussion is, like you were saying before, Brian, that this is generalizable, that that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. That whatever we do, you know, serves as a framework, foundation, whatever you want to call it. So, uh, you know, with that in mind, I like the suggestion. Uh, I would add, however. Uh, you know, if there is the focus and energy to also figure out how to do this with MPLS, uh, even if it fits in a non-normative um, appendix on how you would actually extend the technology, that would be useful. Let me let me make an, another suggestion. The way in which we've run this working group to date, in which I intend to continue running the working group, which has worked very well for us, is anything that is related to current work in IPPM, which has a draft dash name dash IPPM dash whatever title that gets discussed on our list, gets time on our agenda after we've finished all of the working group stuff. So even if some of this, the specific work to actually bring this down to MPLS isn't quite yet on charter yet, it can be co-developed with route and adopted later. Mm. Okay, okay, perfect. I think I think that 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 could actually work out. Yeah, yeah, quite well. Because it might be that it might be that we do want to like if this. I don't want the working group to get so big that it's like you know four sessions and there's the TWAMP people and right. sorry TWAMP people and they're over here and they don't talk to each other. Because the the point of having this all together is so that we can actually cross pollinate some of these ideas. Yep. And if it gets so big that everybody's only focusing on their little thing, then it doesn't work. So we do actually need to figure the scope out. And I not sure I want to move this over to the routing area quite yet. Um, Ooh, but that's a scary um, prospect. <laughs> yeah, this is that's why I raised it that way. Um, but I think that this would allow us to to do what we want to do with the route thing and, and do it in a manageable way. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So so we'll generalize um, the metric definition. Uh, currently the methods are modular and um, sort of distinguished between um, the active uh, trace routey kind of things and the interrogation IOINM kind of things. And there's space that we could eventually insert um, other methods there which are unique to their, their layer, let's say. Um, and that's what I just said. So um, uh, let's see. So that we, we've actually clarified the checksum calculations thanks to Tal's RFC. Uh, that was a, an, an easy reference to make, much appreciated. And um, New sections uh, define it com on combining different me methods. That's really important. That was one of Rudiger's comments. You know, if we if we do an interrogation IOM on a single domain, how do we combine that with an active uh, trace route uh, sort of thing? And and what we've uh, identified there is the key is that you have to have overlapping host identities. Then we can put these different uh, collection results together. Next slide. And then um, we've got these discussion uh, development areas, um, uh, the interaction between host identity and the ability to discern subpaths. That's uh, discussed there in some detail. 
uh, the, the co-authors discussed a temporal composition for root metrics. Uh, we've, we've got some thoughts about that. Um, assessment at IP layer, this is the important point to your uh, question, Nalini. Um, assessment at IP layer re reveals the root ensemble for IP and higher, actually, because we're talking about ports and other things that are higher. So um, that's the conclusion there. And also this idea of class C, which was an important notion in the original framework. Uh, packets treated equally. It's, it would be very useful to know that, to incorporate it as a parameter in the root metric. Uh, it's a concept that we've developed in, in the framework and um, the metric definitions. Next slide. And I would point out it is a, um, an area of active research. Yeah. From yeah. an active measurement standpoint, like how do you, how do, you do this is hard. Yes, yes. Um, and, but this is a clear place where it, where it would be useful to know. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. So here's the to-do list. Uh, I won't go through this in detail, but you can see that there was lots of things here that, that Carlos suggested, and we thank him uh, again for that. And um, also the, the the one from Frank on uh, using the IOAM loopback fit. Uh, and then if we uh, do MPLS, I guess we're not going to do that, but uh, we might be able to still talk about TTL propagate or something like that. Nalini. Uh, you know, going back to your last slide just for a second, the one, one right before, the IP and higher, you have IP and lower too. I mean, I know this is shocking, but I mean, interface ID is actually, you know, layer two. Well, well, but that's yeah. information you collect. It's not. Oh yeah, no, it's, I, not, it's, it's wonderful. Not, it's yeah. not root determining. I think that's the point. I yeah, mean, yeah. Start with a source and a, and a dest, and yeah. Yeah, because there's something in there. Is, I don't want to. We can discuss offline because there's something in there about like you can't determine certain things at the IP layer if it's the same host, but indeed you can. Right, you right. If you've got because if you have a different inter if you if you've got if you've got information below, yeah, that, which is what we've talked about. Yeah, you know, whatever the whatever the hosts are willing to reveal, that's what we've got. You know? Sure, sure. Yeah. And you're not you're not like you're not like you know just saying I'm just going to do one layer. Yeah. If you do multi layer, you yeah you're good. Yeah. Um. Then back up. Yeah. We hold on. All right. The whole multi-screen thing is messing with me a bit. Uh, so next steps. Um. Please read and review. How many people already read it? Uh, yeah, it's a decent showing, plus the people who aren't here, and, and we did get lots of comments. So we're, we're kind of interested in working group adoption of the draft, now that we have a clearer view of the scope. Um, really, this is the metric side of the work we took up uh, earlier this year, the uh, telemetry data, IOINM. I mean, this is a, this is a tool that's going to enable measurement of the route that we'd like to put a metric on. And this is our traditional work. We started out defining metrics here and uh, the methods of measurement. Well, now we've got to catch up, really. Uh, that's my appeal. Let's, let's have a root metric available when this IONM uh, data becomes available. Uh, and we could create a milestone for this as a first step. That would be great, too. Um, so so um, actually, could I see the hands for who's read it again? Um, can I see the hands for um, who hasn't read it yet, but after this presentation is interested in reading it? Okay, that looks all right. That's enough for me. I'm going to go ahead and ask um, for a really loud hum because they've turned on the turbines to change the air out in here. Um, so um, if you would like to see us uh, adopt a uh, milestone for um, unidirectional route metrics, and this as the initial document for that with the title draft IETF IPPM, IPPM Aura. Um, I like the title, so I'm going to go ahead and put that in the hum. Um, please hum now. Um, if uh, you would not like to see um, this uh, milestone on our charter or have serious problems with this being the draft for it, um, please hum very loudly now. That seems pretty clear to me. So we're going to go ahead and do a call for an adoption on the list. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, working group. Cool. I think that's it. That is it. All right. And then I think we are now, oh, come on. Do stamp. There we go. OK. Um, so uh, we started a um, uh, new work that uh, concentrate on test uh, protocol. Um, and um, so we're bringing two documents, individuals, uh, drafts, 
One is the base specification and the data model. Uh, data model, uh, we see it's important because uh, since there is no uh, plan to create a control plane uh, protocol um, to control uh, instances of uh, sender and reflector uh, in SDN manner uh, using the data model. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what's the scope? Uh, one of the first uh, requirements that we set to ourselves is that uh, to make it on-wire compatible uh, with the T-RAMP uh, in unauthenticated mode. And uh, that uh, basically um, directed us to uh, use sender format and reflector format that are uh, used in the T-RAMP test. But at the same time, based on experience, so we looked at uh, certain feedback uh, from deployments, especially uh, T1 flight, and uh, document developed in a broadband forum TR390 performance measurement bef uh, between um, CE and IP edge, uh, which suggests that um, default uh, symmetrical uh, packets is uh, very uh, much appreciated and useful. Um, so uh, that's we can go to the next slide. And uh, so this is their uh, sender format. Uh, as you see, so we already uh, set uh, 27 bytes of uh, padding to make it symmetrical and then accommodate of um, copied packets optional uh, parameters that will follow this uh, 27 bytes uh, padding. Uh, for functional extensions, we propose to use TLVs so that uh, if um, there is a deployment scenario where we have stamp sender and t wamp light uh, reflector, uh, for the t wamp reflector, that they will look like uh, padding and they will just uh, reflect, and uh, that can be uh, figured out through a data model, and the test still can be performed on the basic metrics. So that's the idea. Um, so the reflector format uh, will be somewhat different, but again, um, the idea is that uh, it will be symmetrical. Uh, of course, for the control uh, from the data model, uh, that can be uh, changed, but uh, otherwise, it's symmetrical. Yeah, that's a sender and that's a reflector. Um, now, um, so we kind of figured out uh, within offers uh, our idea of where we want to take uh, unauthenticated mode, but uh, then uh, the security comes. And uh, taking advantage of um, our proposal that we discussed in Prague and now um, Al presented on um, reassigning a UDP port 862 for the test protocol, we propose that this port will be used as a default port uh, for the stamp protocol and other options will have uh, use of all dynamic range. So that gives us compatibility again uh, with the t in uh, unauthenticated mode at the same time, their provisioning of the reflector becomes much more simpler because uh, we can have a default and uh, don't touch it unless we need it. Um, the next question is, so um, because uh, introduction and definition of well-known port creates a potential uh, uh, attack vector or somebody will be trying to skew the measurement by intercepting packets and holding them hostage for a while so that measurements will go inaccurate, uh, 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 how we can do that? The initial idea of uh, TWAM test protocol to use and negotiate dynamic uh, ports was very nice because it uh, uh, prevented this. So the detecting of test flow was, was much harder. Now with a well-known port, it becomes more exposed. So um, what we do, uh, there is a trade-off and that for us, uh, something is open question that we want to uh, have uh, the discussion with the working group is, so how we can protect uh, the test uh, data plane, uh, the test packets, 
at the same time providing uh, accurate and uh, meaningful uh, measurement because the problem uh, with authentication and encryption as already being pointed out uh, in 5357 is such that we want to do timestamp very close to the hardware at the same time we need to do certain operation on um, securing the packet. Uh, there was interesting, very useful comment from Henrik, who after zero version now joined us and now is a co-author of this proposal, is to have characteristic of uh, how the timestamp being acquired in a packet. So basically introduce a sub-registry where we can uh, define the code points that characterize whether it's a software-based timestamp, whether it's a hardware close to tr uh, transmit, or when it's a hardware being put on fly in the transmit. So exactly meaning and interpretation of the coin points is open for discussion, but uh, this is something that um, can be discussed. At the same time, uh, we realized that that can be uh, uh, information that only communicated in the data model. So there is a trade-off whether we put it in a packet or we just expose it in the data model. Again, something to discuss. Um, yes, another thing is back to the uh, discussion of the timestamp format, uh, like uh, in TWAMP, uh, we uh, already uh, provision uh, possibility of using NTP and uh, PTP uh, timestamp formats. And um, it's in a manner that actually uh, the sender and reflector, they can use uh, different timestamp formats, but that is uh, communicated in a, in a packet so that uh, the sender, because only the sender uh, does uh, calculation of delay and jitter, so he needs just to interpret both formats, and this is a control plane function, nothing to do with the data plane, and uh, that's why uh, this uh, heterogeneous deployment, uh, in our opinion, is uh, possible. So we can go to the next. Um, yeah, so uh, it's already mentioned uh, uh, the TOV. Uh, there was a proposal not to use TOV, but use a uh, uh, be it uh, failed option um, declaration. Again, that's something that we open to discussion and uh, we appreciate comments uh, on the mailing list from the working group. Uh, next slide. Um, so, yes, the idea is that in unauthenticated um, mode, um, stamp sender can be compatible with the T1 uh, light uh, reflector. And especially we got a uh, discussion with the uh, offer of TR390 uh, that uh, it will be good that uh, it is a well-known port will be a default port. So thus um, uh, T1 flight equipment that uh, compliant with the TR390 uh, uh, doesn't need to have to be provisioned and works uh, seamlessly. Next, please. Uh, so the data model, um, the idea is that uh, use of data model uh, is uh, supporting enabling uh, SDN uh, uh, environment uh, where we control everything uh, from their uh, controller or orchestrator. And um, because we have a single point of control, we can uh, control both configuration and operational state of sender and reflector and um, so data model reflects uh, what already being said is that symmetrical size uh, use of uh, UDP port 862 as a default port uh, and uh, then uh, we propose um, performance metrics uh, including uh, percentile as uh, a feedback from operators the percentile uh, is very useful uh, in their operation and uh, they uh, suggested to have it uh, something that the level of percentile can be set. Uh, whether it will be set uh, 
throughout the all metrics or for each metric like uh, uh, percentile uh, scale for uh, one way delay uh, will be different for percentile scale for packet loss that's something to discuss I we believe that uh, one scale percentile for all metrics is a sufficient because uh, we provide an option to configure define uh, three different levels of percentile so if there is interest to support usually it's like 95 99 and 99.9 uh, the percentile being used but uh, at the same time we provide um, option to change that and I think that's it um, so again uh, this is just work started uh, we appreciate your comments especially your thoughts on uh, securing uh, the test protocol um, there was one interesting discussion I had uh, offline uh, where I realized that we might not need to do uh, very much security for IPv4 because of um, communication that ISG had that uh, actually development of new functionality for IPv4 uh, to seize and we do development of new protocols for IPv6 so uh, if that's something that would be acceptable then for IPv4 we'll leave only uh, unauthenticated option and then a uh, secure option would be for IPv6 just as an observer of the um, ways and mysteries of the IESG um, I'm not certain that that argument's going to make it through a sector review um, okay. because no, that, my, that, my understanding is that, that so the the um, the ceasing new development on IPv4 doesn't mean don't secure stuff on IPv4 um, but I mean so then there's the there's the real question in the case so the real you have to look at what the what the encryption is buying you right so that's I think that's where the that's where the discussion needs to happen what are the requirements right like so what are the requirements what are the trade-offs and the trade-offs are um, somebody knows that this is stamp traffic can mess with the stamp traffic and screw up your measurements and then the question is what's the threat model why would they do that and, you know, some of those threat models are um, more theoretical and some of those threat models you actually have to worry about right so again since okay since we are going with the uh, um, networks that care about SLA uh, skewing the measurement yeah, make, is a problem yes right. that's a problem yeah. okay because basically they make your measurement worse than the, your network is uh, forcing you unnecessary actions and yeah. so, so it, I, basically creating instability on yeah. the network in this indirect manner so it's a real it's a, uh, it's a problem right so it, it's a real problem so this this is something that would need to be addressed in the security consideration section there'd have to be an analysis done uh in an eventual draft so you just made a a um request i'm trying to speed up so we can get through the mm -hmm. uh, the, the lightning talks i'd like to try and give right. everybody some time um you made a request for adoption i brought up the list of current drafts just to see how much room we have because what we've done in a lot of cases is you know brought stuff on until we had like a certain amount of stuff and then um developed things in a holding pattern as individual and then went ahead and adopted them and brought them through um i'm looking at where we are with our current drafts though so we've got this one which is um v602 uh that is going to go into last call no wait we, i need a shepherd write up that one's um uh, 2330 IPv6 needs a needs a write up, and I just assigned me, right? Um, so we're going to start LC on that, um, and I'll do uh, the write up. Um, we have Altmark, which is an ISG evaluation. We have model based metrics, which is in the Ed queue. We have TUMP Yang, which is going to have a 06 and is going to be out. Um, so we've got three that are off our list we've we're bringing on twamp port which will be really quick yes um we're bringing on aura which will probably not take as long as model based metrics but might um and i think we have another slot here so um i'm going to go ahead and do the humming thing again 
um, who is so this has a this draft has kind of a very long history, right? So um, it started off as um, T Wamp Light. Um, yes, true. And this is sort of a, a, an effort to essentially standardize that in a way that is safe to use. And what's happened in the in the intervening time is um, the uh, the um, juggernaut and behemoth that is Yang has now given us a way to put a control um, plane on top of this thing, and that that's sort of what's changed here. So, um, who here has read this draft or is familiar with TWAMP Light? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, it's the same. The, the usual, the usual um, active measurement protocol suspects. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and, and do the hum for a. Um, uh, I'll have to. We'll we'll have to figure out how to do. Okay, so to adopt a milestone for the definition of a TWAMP light compatible protocol controlled by Yang called Stamp, and this document as the. Um, uh, as the milestone for that, please hum now. Okay, uh, uh, hum slightly higher um, acoustic energy than the air conditioner. Um, for uh, if you would not like to adopt this document, please hum now. Um, that's below the noise floor on the conditioner, but given that it's a, a TWAMP thing, um, I think that's sufficient to take it to the list. So we'll we'll do a call for adoption on the list. Thank you, I mean, busy on the list after uh, after this. So with that, um, we are now into the lightning round of our meeting, um, and we are about we had five minutes of buffer, and we're ten minutes late. So I'm going to ask the lightning talk people to be um, quick if you can, um, so that we get a chance for everybody who is on this list to go. Um, I'd really like to give Tal a chance. He's been over there um, furiously typing um, uh, the discussions up, and I'd, I'd really like him to get a, to a chance to say his stuff. So um, how are you, Song? You've got three in a row. Yeah. So okay. let's just yeah, okay. run through. Cool, thanks. Um, I'm going to talk about three uh, individual drops. Uh, um, with each, uh, try to addressing, uh, uh, try to address a specific issues we found in the current uh, IOM specification. Um, of course, uh, the pro proposed solution here is, uh, is not the only way to solve these issues, uh, but we just uh, uh, hope uh, this can help the community to be aware of these issues and eventually come, come up with uh, newer or even better solutions. Here, this is just a, uh, or, um, uh, we, uh, the, the best solution we can think of uh, to address these issues. Um, okay, the first one is about uh, the data type extension. Uh, currently, uh, the, the specification uh, defined uh, using a 16-bit uh, bitmap to indicate uh, different data types. So uh, uh, it can, at most, uh, support up to 16 uh, standard data types. But we can see uh, with the new applications emerge, new use case emerge, uh, we will eventually use up all this um, Bits. So if we want to continue to scale to support more uh, data types we uh, and still use uh, this bitmap encoding style, then we need to find a, a way to ex extend it. So here's a, a, the proposal is we just reserve the last bit in this current bitmap to indicate there's another uh, extended bitmap uh, uh, follow the, the, the first uh, uh, header words. So uh, with this simple extension, we can uh, immediately support another up to uh, 31 new data types. So again, we reserve the, the next bitmap last uh, uh, bit to indicate uh, if it's one, may, maybe indicates an, another um, uh, bitmap follow that. So with this, uh, using this approach, we can continue to extend the bitmap to support more and more standard data types. And if we, the last bit is set to zero, which means, okay, there's no more bitmaps follows. And uh, after that, we will see the uh, actual node data. So this is uh, the first, uh, next next slide. Uh, so there are several use cases we already find. Um, in the, some, uh, the, um, for example, uh, there are some middle box in the network 
which will change the uh, flow packet header. If we want, you, if we want to keep tracking uh, the the uh, the flow identification, we need to have a way to actually save some of the header fields into the IOM data. So we we may need to define new data types uh, in the bitmap. Uh, also, there are uh, different different application scenarios uh, like in the wireless, mobile, and optical networks, uh, which may require uh, different type of data, such as the uh, power, temperature, signal strength, GPS location, uh, and so on. They may all need their own data types defined in the uh, bitmap. Okay, there are also other uh, possible uh, data types like the uh, metered flow bandwidth, uh, time gap between. Uh, two consecutive flow packets and the buffer occupancy uh, of, of the node and, and so on. So uh, we can see there are plenty of uh, use cases which may require uh, more data types. So this uh, first uh, improvement uh, might be necessary. Okay, uh, next one. Okay, so the second proposal is, is about how we can limit the uh, IOM data overhead. So we know um, uh, the the IOM header can pose a significant overhead to the packet itself. Um, if we want to uh, collect uh, more data uh, and per node, and uh, also the 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 pass uh, collecting pass is long, then the, the accumulated data may uh, eat up a, a, a big chunk of the use uh, useful network bandwidth. So how to limit that? So one way to do that is uh, we simply uh, know what's the uh, maximum overhead we can uh, support. Then also, if we know how much data we want to collect uh, at each node, then we can calculate uh, how many um, hops we can accumulate the data. And then at that point, we have to strip off the um, IOM data and shift it out. Then uh, start from there, we will re refresh the IOM header and start to uh, collect the, the, the data uh, uh, from scratch. And of course, the collector, as the collector, it can combine, you know, this, uh, the, the IOM data, uh, data for each segment and combine them together to form the, um, the to, to, to get the data for the entire, entire pass. So the, uh, the proposal is also very simple. We just uh, uh, re reuse some uh, one byte of the header, uh, header field, and we use one bit uh, in the uh, flag field to to indicate this is a segment um, um, IOM, right? Then then uh, we use four four bit to indicate the segment size, which uh, actually uh, just uh, uh, indicates the number of uh, hops we can uh, collect the IOM data. And this is the remaining hop, so the indicates, okay, which part we already are in this segment. Uh, and each hop is simply uh, uh, decrements this number by one, right? So if, if the R hop uh, reach zero, we know we, we already reached the uh, segment boundary. Then we need to strip off the IOM data. And uh, then we reset this uh, to the to to be equal to the uh, segment size and start over again. Uh, so uh, by doing this, we can uh, we can know uh, what's the maximum size of the IOM IOM header. So next slide. Uh, we list uh, several use cases. So in one extreme case, we can just set the segment size to one. Uh, which basically uh, ask uh, uh, require uh, the, the each node to send the IOM data out immediately. It never puts the data actual data in the IOM header, so we can uh, uh, minimize uh, the um, overhead. Also, it has a side benefit. If the packet is happily dropped in the network, we know exactly where it's dropped by just a uh, check. Okay at which point we stop receiving any more uh, IOM data for flow. Also, uh, there, there might be some uh, uh, practical limitations on the M MTU. Uh, so this gave us the upper, uh, upper boundary for the, for the packet size. So we can, uh, based on the what, what amount of data we, we need to collect at each node, then we can calculate exactly 
uh, what the segment size uh, is. Uh, also, um, there, there might be a very long pass. So if you want to keep accumulate data in one, uh, at each node, you know, it will eventually uh, exceed the capability of a, a, the each node. Uh, because each node data plane device may exa examine at most that amount of uh, header, header data. If it's too deep, it can uh, no, no longer to process it. So in that case, we have to limit the, uh, the, the size of the IOM header. So we, we, we have to use uh, the, some uh, idea like the segment uh, IOM. OK, next one. So here comes the last one um, about the uh, OM, IOM data uh, validate, validation option. So basically, we uh, propose two type of uh, uh, bitmaps to indicate the, the data uh, validation uh, vali uh, va uh, validator indicator. The first one is a, a bitmap uh, is for uh, to indicate the, the node uh, validate uh, to validate the nodes. So uh, some some IOM uh, capable nodes uh, they can process the the IOM header. But for some reason, maybe it's too busy, or um, for some other reason, it's just uh, 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 refuse to add the IOM data. Uh, so it can simply set a bit in the, in this uh, node valid bit map to indicate, OK, uh, I will not participate uh, this session, and I won't add any data uh, to, 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 the, to this following uh, data list. So, uh, so the receiver can just uh, uh, ignore that part, or or it's just uh, don't in the, uh, insert data in this list, and uh, keep pack data together to to uh, save the uh, space. So another useful uh, bitmap is applied for each node in this uh, uh, data list, right? So. Uh, so there might be uh, the, the source may require us for different type of data, uh, data. But some uh, nodes may find it cannot support this type of data. Maybe uh, due to the uh, you know the version difference, or just uh, the source asks for some data. This this node is, is incapable of uh, uh, providing that type of data, or it might be also too busy to handle that request. So in that case, it can also uh, set just set a bit in this uh, in the bitmap. For example, here is the uh, the source ask for the this 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 data, one two three four five six seven seven different type of data. But here uh, we have this valid data bitmap for each each uh, data node to indicate okay, this data and this data we cannot provide it. Then we can only provide five of them. So then the following data array, we only provide five uh, valid data. But these two atoms are just uh, invalid. We can, can be ignored. So by doing this, we can uh, also uh, support different use cases. OK, just so one more minute, the last slide. So yeah, I, I already mentioned, maybe we won't, uh, I, will, I will not repeat it. Just, uh, uh, this is used to handle uh, uh, in the case that some nodes just uh, uh, want to uh, refuse to serve some data requirement, or it can be incapable of providing that kind of data. So for this use cases, uh, this uh, improvement is useful. So that's one, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So um, comments or questions on this, please take them to the list. Um, so next. Uh, good, mo good morning. I'm Xiaomi from CT. Uh, this chapter is on the extended OM to convey in situ OM configuration state. Uh, intention of this chapter, this job provide a method for the IOM encapsulating node to uh, determine the IOM header. And in this, this draft, uh, uh, dynamic acquisition is proposed. Uh, traditional OM mechanisms such as uh, SMP ping, 
or NPLS uh, ping can be used to convey LM configuration state. Uh, th this diagram uh, illustrates the uh, uh, principle of this draft. Uh, IOM encapsulating node can uh, send echo request to uh, every IOM transit node or IOM decapsulating node in this IOM domain. And every uh, receiving node uh, uh, can respond uh, with uh, echo reply. And uh, this echo reply uh, includes its uh, uh, IOM configuration state. Next. Uh, a new TLV, uh, IOM configuration data TLV is introduced in uh, echo request. Uh, when this TLV is present uh, in echo request, uh, it means that uh, IOM encapsulating node requests the receiving node to uh, reply with this IOM configuration data. Next. Uh, at the same time, uh, a new TLV, IOM configuration data TLV, is also introduced in uh, echo reply. And uh, the next uh, uh, four slides uh, uh, show the sub TLVs that can uh, can be included. <laughs> okay. So uh, we we'll ask for uh, more review and the comments and uh, revise this draft to resolve comments and then maybe ask for uh, looking over adoption. So please have a look and um, if you um, if you see something you like, take it to the list. If you see something you don't like, take it to the list. Um, yeah. And then next. Next. Uh, this just is a uh, direct extension for direct uh, intention. Okay. Uh, the TWAP, we think TWAP currently TWAP, uh, has already uh, kind of a synthetic loss measurement, but uh, maybe it's not uh, accurate enough so we want to extend it to that to support direct loss measurement. Okay, thanks. Uh, control, uh, to have control extension. A new uh, direct loss measurement flag is introduced in this draft, and it's backward uh, compatible with that uh, uh, already find the uh, flags. Next. Uh, this is an uh, extension to uh, to have test. Uh, first, uh, send the test packet a new uh, send TX counter is added to this packet. And this set set to the number of IP packets of the particular monitor flow transmitted towards the refractor. Next. Uh, for the refractor test packet, uh, three new counters uh, is added. added. Uh, so, OK, next. Uh, this is the uh, calculation formulas for the traffic loss calculation. And uh, you can use this formulas to uh, calculate the far end loss, near end loss, far end loss ratio, and the near end loss ratio. OK, next. Also the same. Ask for uh, comments, and uh, we will revise it as draft. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. And same comments from the chair. If you see something you like, take it to the list. If you see something you don't like, take it to the list. Thank you very much. So next we have Giuseppe. Oh, there you go. Morning. This is an update uh, about uh, multipoint marking draft. Next. Uh, document change from 00, 0 version to 0, 01 version makes two, two important modifications. The addition of a new section about the correlation with RFC uh, 5644, thanks to all Morton for the comment. In particular, we need to extend some definition of this RFC because. Um, this is limited to active measurement, so we need to extend the multi-party metrics from one to group also to group to group, and the same for segment metrics. And also we added um, some definition and some new methodology for delay, in particular uh, some RFC of uh, about the hashing selection uh, methodology, uh, 5474 and 5475. Next. So why we need multi-point marking? So, uh, alternate marking works very well by definition in case of multi-point paths, but uh, this draft is very useful because uh, we need to formalize how the marking method can work in case of multi-point uh, paths. And we need a draft to formalize and uh, to uh, highlight the property of this methodology. So in this way, you can choose the identification fields and the, the filter criteria uh, without any constraint. Next. 
So in general, for example, you can imagine to have uh, an SDN controller. If you, if you have an SDN controller that can manage all uh, your network with a marking method, you can calculate the network packet loss. That, that is the difference between the number of input packets minus the number of output packets. So in case, of, in case of we have no packet loss, okay, no problem. But in case we have packet loss, we have to individuate the flow that uh, is experimented the packet loss. So we can identify the subnetworks that uh, are the smallest subnetworks where the packet loss property is still valid. So the number of incoming packets is equal to the number of uh, outgoing packets. So next. So we can individuate the cluster. Why is it useful the identification of this cluster and of these subnetworks? Because if you have your whole network and if you are experiment some packet loss, you can make a per cluster basis analysis. So in if you once you have individuated the cluster that is experimented packet loss, you can make a detailed analysis on only on that cluster without uh, so without uh, use a lot of resources and so on. So this give more flexibility and um, uh, resource savings. Next. Okay, this part of the presentation is about the delay. So the mean delay works in case of multipoint. The double marking delay doesn't work in case of multipoint. But uh, we have found some uh, result in RFSC 5474 and 5475 about using of hashing selection for uh, sampled packets and. Uh, this make uh, this a uh, methodology that coupled with the uh, marking methodology very powerful. Next, uh, in fact, the IFSC 5475 have the same weakness that can be solved by the coupling with the uh, marking method methodology. The first weakness is that we have a difficult implementation of the hashing selection in a continuous packet flow, but the marking method can anchor uh, the samples. Um, within a marking period. And this is very useful, in particular for the correlation aspect. The second problem that is solved by marking uh, method is the um, possibility to have a dynamic cache. So to change within a, a marking uh, batches the um, number of hash bits in order to make sure and to guarantee that the number of samples are almost constant uh, within a marking period. Next. So we got some input during the IETF last call that uh, makes also, also this work very interesting. And um, we got some reviews um, before the, this IETF meeting from Old Morton and uh, um, we would to address this, uh, um, this comment in the next uh, version. So next slide. Uh, okay, this is a summary. Hope uh, you can read this draft because uh, in particular is a good next step for marking method. And I suggest also to read the compact alternate marking draft that is related. Cool, thank you very much. And wow, exactly five minutes, you um. <laughs> yeah, well done, thanks. Thanks. And My name is uh, Talmis Rahi, and this draft is called Compact Alternate Marking. Uh, it's joint work with Carmi, Giuseppe, Mauro, Mac, Vero and Greg. Uh, just to satisfy my curiosity, how many people have read the draft? Okay, thanks. So what we're trying to do here is to measure the performance between two measurement points, MP1 and MP2. Next, please. And alternate marking in general is a method which uses a marking field in the header. This field is used for coloring the packets between the two MP uh, measurement points and it uh, splits the traffic into consecutive blocks of data. Next, please. So the scope of this draft is to define a set of compact alternate marking methods, which means we use just one bit per data packet or zero bits per data packet. Next, please. So one existing alternate marking method, which is, used, which is worth mentioning in this context, next, please is the double marking method. The idea is that in every data packet, we use two bits. One bit is used as a color indication. The other is used as a timestamp indication. Uh, next, next, please. OK, so in this draft, one of the methods we define, which uses just a single bit 
per packet is called multiplexed marking. The idea is that instead of using the two bits from the double marking method, we multiplex these two bits. We use the uh, exclusive or between them. And that allows the same level of accuracy as the double marking method with, with just one bit per data packet. Next, please. Another possible uh, compact alternate marking method is called pulse marking. The idea is that in each time period, we have just one packet, which uses a different marking um, value. And that one packet per period is used as a reference for the measurement, both loss and delay measurement in that period. Next, please. The draft also defines methods uh, with zero marking. And the idea is to use hash-based selection. So instead of using a field in the header, we compute a hash over the uh, sum of the fields in the header. And then if the hash is equal to a predefined value, then the packet is used as a reference for measurement. And of course, we can use mixed approaches where we use one bit in the header and also we use the hash. Next, please. <clears throat> Next. Yeah. OK, so the draft also includes a summary of all the existing alternate marking methods and the new methods, which are presented in this draft. It also presents kind of a comparison and a trade-off between them. Next, please. <clears throat> So one thing that may come to mind is, OK, another internet draft which presents things that will never get implemented. So this is not the case here. We actually presented a live demo uh, in the ITF 99 bits and bytes. Uh, Giuseppe and Mauro from Telecom Italia are actually experimenting with some of these methods on their network. So this is actually being implemented in practice. Next, please. <clears throat> so. Please do not read this draft if you're not interested in performance measurement. However, if you are interested in performance measurement, you should definitely read this draft. You should definitely have an opinion about it. And we want to hear that opinion on the mailing list. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, wow, we have two minutes left. Um, it's not enough for any other business. Uh, so. Um, uh, thank you very much, everyone. This was, I think, this is a really good meeting. Um, I've got a bunch of to-do items, which will, at some point later in the week, um, once uh, once my queue drains a bit, will lead to a flurry of emails to the mailing list. Um, so there's some shepherd write-ups to do. We've got uh, one, two, three um, working group calls for adoption coming out, um, and uh, yeah, so. With that, I will see you all in, where are we next? Prague. Yeah, we keep going here. OK, London. Yes, OK, so I'll see you all in London. Um, have a great rest of your year and a great rest of your week. Thanks a lot. Bye. Yeah, <laughs> no.